Hello everybody, I'm going to speak to you about the management of tone in cerebral palsy. Um, I specialize in neurorehabilitation and I run that service in Amrita. My areas of specialization are adult and pediatric spasticity, disorders of consciousness, and peripheral nerve injury. When we talk about tone issues in cerebral palsy, we're starting with a skewed presentation where 77% of patients will have a spastic presentation, the rest will be dyskinetic, ataxic, hypotonic, or others. So the goal of managing tone is to keep our patients on the path. And what path is that? The spasticity will determine what their GMCS status is. Um, from the age of 0 to the age of 3, that GMFCS status is being developed. And from about age 3 to 5, it's pretty much set for the rest of their life. If we were to extend that graph further, you'd see by about the age of 30, it starts deteriorating. So our goal is to keep these patients on their path and prevent further deterioration. Why manage tone? So if you can't change the GMFCS, then why bother treating it? Well, the thing is, if you manage tone properly, you can allow for better function, and better function allows more participation in life activities. The problem with treating uh, spasticity, it's a game of threshold. There's many things that make it manifest while it's always there. So extent of CNS injury, noxious stimuli, intra or extra receptive, temperature, medication, mood, activity, sleep, age and aging, all come into play to make that spasticity worse or better. To understand spasticity, you know the subcomponents. There's four of them. The tonic, which is related to the upper motor neuron no longer acting properly, so the dysregulation of the anterior horn cell. Uh, next is the phasic aspect, which is related to the polysynaptic reflexes. Next is the rheological, which is a muscle change that happened due to spasticity, where the muscle can actually drive the spasticity further, and the extrinsic stimuli that can also make spasticity happen. We have to know how to measure spasticity, and the modified Ashford scale is one of those simple scales for doing that. It basically measures out the tonic changes in spasticity and doesn't give you much more of an idea until you get into the fourth, which is also including the rheological changes where there's a contracture. The Tardu scale is a very fine-tuned scale that helps us measure not only the tonic and phasic aspects of spasticity, but also the rheological. In such a fine-tuned scale, you can use it to measure response to treatment. But if you really want to see how spasticity affects a person, then you need functional scales. And that's where the Shriners Hospital Upper Extremity Exam comes in, Functional Mobility Scale, Wisconsin Gates Scale, and these scales help us understand how our patient's quality of life has improved based on our treatment. When we look at spasticity, it's basically a network. And it's a network that feeds itself. The components of the network go and make the spasticity manifest or diminish. The spasticity can actually feed the subcomponents. Treatment then is of two types. One are the oral antispastics, intrathecal baclofen, or single event multi level chemoneurolysis, which diminish the potency of the network but leave it intact. Or selective dorsal rhizotomy, which is a very destructive procedure that diminishes its potency by destroying it. Let's talk about some treatment modalities. Oral agents like diazepam, baclofen, tizanidine, these are all things that we know. Um, they all modify the tonic aspect of spasticity while ignoring the other three subcomponents, whereas dantrolene works on the phasic aspect, ignoring the other three components. If you go by the NICE guidelines, you can use oral agents for discomfort or pain, muscle spasms, or functional disability. All these drugs have side effects that tend to come in the form of constipation or cognitive changes, so there's a limit to how much you can use. The next modality is neurolysis, and neurolysis again works on the tonic aspect of spasticity. There's two agents I commonly use, one is Botox, the other one is phenol. Um, Botox, while well, you can use in any muscle, phenol can only be used in large muscles. Um, while Botox is painless, phenol is painful at the injection time. And while Botox is reversible, phenol is destructive. 
So Botox will last about three to five months and phenol can go for six to eight months. Um, when I do Botox, I'll do under general anesthesia with ultrasound guidance and if I do phenol, I'll use the nerve stimulator with the patient awake. So there's a big cost difference. Botox can come to about 15,000 rupees every time I do it and phenol can come to about 1,250 rupees every time I use it. And I might not use it more than once or twice in a patient. Cyclodorsal rhizotomy is one of the two modalities I'm going to really expand on in this talk, so this is going to be a lot to hear. Cyclodorsal rhizotomy directly addresses the tonic aspect of spasticity, and when it does it so well, it also eventually evolves the phasic and the rheological aspects too. But what you're going to see here is Oswestry criteria for who's the right patient. You should know at the start, this is biased towards children who can already walk. So the ideal patient per Oswestry is 5 to 10 years old, less than 5, they may not know why you're doing a surgery, more than 10, they might get neuropathic pain, absence of chronic conditions, IQ better than 70, well motivated, no other surgeries before, and a good family support. You can do the surgery, but if they don't get therapy afterward, it's going to be a waste. On examination, these children should be spastic diplegic, severe hemiplegia, or have hereditary spastic paraplegia. And they should have moderate to severe spasticity, a mean lower limb power greater than 3, and movement control at least moderate, moderate balance, no other fixed deformities, and no involuntary movements or dystonias. This surgery can actually make the dystonia worse. And on investigation, no hip dysplasia, no basal ganglia changes, and they shouldn't be chubby, overweight kids. Now, the surgery is something that neurosurgery and I both do together. The surgeon actually cuts while I guide him with intra monitoring. So you can see on the right, there's a picture with all these EMG needles sticking into muscles that correlate to the L2345 S1 root level muscles. Neurosurgery, the neurosurgeon will then go and do a laminotomy. Um, expose the cauda equina, and it's about a 3 centimeter incision, and from there pick up the nerve roots and begin stimulating them. This is where I come in, interpreting what's being done. So as a neurosurgeon stimulates the L5 nerve root, an example, you would expect the L5 correlating muscle to act and nothing else, and that's what you see in that green box in the top left. Now everything else is an abnormal response, so if it's a spastic fascicle, you might find that all the root levels on that side activate. You might find all the root levels on the opposite side activate. You might find a bilateral response, you might find a prolonged response. All these are abnormal responses and they indicate a spastic fascicle that the surgeon will then trim by 40 to 60 percent depending on the level we're at. There are super segmental benefits to this surgery. It's not just reducing tone in the lower extremities. The child can now sit better. There's improved locomotion, better range of movement, increased gait speed, easier to do self-care and ADLs using the upper extremities just because the spasticity is now down. down. Um, secondary improvement in upper extremity function, long-term effects that last greater than 10 years, and improved behavior. Post-operatively, we work on balancing, stretching, and strengthening so these kids can stand up properly and move their bodies, identify co-activating muscles, selectively retrain the muscles to behave the way we want, and address neuropathic pain. This slide is, is to show you the change in tone per procedure, and this is a really complicated slide, it's so going to simplify it. The top four lines all show you Botox, phenol, oral, antispastics, and intrathecal baclofen. And what they do is these all will slowly bring down your, bring down the spasticity, um, depending on how you titrate their doses. So the family can slowly get adjusted to this change in tone. Um, when you do a selective dose rhizotomy, preoperatively the child will have an Ashworth 4 or a 3. That tone can drop by almost two full points by the next post-op day. And this can horrify a parent because they've seen that child stand on spastic legs all these years. Now their legs are wobbly and they think that everything has gone bad. This is a normal response. The muscles are still active. They just have to be retrained to do their work. 
Now, this is evidenced by this uh, study, and it shows the amount of power regained in six months post-procedure, post-intervention. We don't really know how much power is regained with oral antispastics, um, etc., um, but with this HDR, they can gain by 1.5 MRC. In the long term, there's no change in GMCS. There's no deterioration in functional status at 5 and 10 years, no sensory issues, and less need for orthopedic procedures with less invasive procedures. This is our uh, data from Amrita. And you can see, these are all children in GMCS 3. These are the kids that have done in the past 3 years. You can see uh, with SDR, the change in modified Ashford score, GMFM, press, progress, progress, Passive range of movement, active range of movement are all much more than with Botox, oral endospastics, or PT alone. These are the peak changes. Now, the peak change for an SDR patient might come after a year, whereas Botox might happen somewhere in the third or fourth month. And oral endospastics, when you can get the right dose, that doesn't cause a side effect. You can see our results for our GMCS4 patients. Um, again, it's not quite as good as the GMCS3 group, but these kids are sitting. And they still do get overall better changes compared to the Botox or oral antispastic or PT alone groups. Now, all these patients are actually getting therapy along the side. But this SDR really brings the tone down so they can benefit from the therapy. The next modality is intrathecal backlift and pump, and this is going to be another long one. Um, this again addresses the tonic aspect of spasticity. We use it for GMFCS 3, 4, and 5 with an Ashworth of 3 or 4. We do not do it for children that are too small to come at the pump. Um, local or systematic intercurrent infections, coexisting uncontrolled epilepsy, coagulation disorders, previous spinal fusion, malnutrition, or respiratory disorders. This is basically a pump. It's in the, it sits in the subcutaneous space and it has a catheter that runs to the intrathecal space, pumping out the molecule baclofen into the CSF, where it begins to act on the spinal cord. There's two types of pumps out right now. One is a battery-driven kind. The most popular is by Medtronic. And the other kind is driven by Noble Gas, which is made by Trichumed. We use the Trichumed pump in Amrita. We've done one so far. Each pump weighs 100 grams and can pump out 100 to 150 micrograms of baclofen per day, depending on how you titrate the concentration. Intrathecal baclofen withdrawal is a life-threatening complication associated with this. It is due to the battery stopping or the pump running empty. Um, it can present as seizures, fever, sepsis, acute distress without cause, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion. When you see all this, you're really wondering, do you interrupt the network or you depress the network? And this is a group that had the same doubt. So this is in the UK, and these people had 13 patients who were scheduled to have their pump removed and possibly get a new pump. Now, rather than put a new pump in, what they did is they did a selective dorsal rhizotomy instead, and you can see the effects here. The Ashford score was much more diminished with the SDR patients versus when they were on intrathecal baclofen. At 6 and 12 months, 90% of the parents felt improvement in spasticity versus ITB. And the parents report that nursing and day-to-day -day care was easier post-SDR versus ITB. And children gained more functional improvement and became less irritable. Now that's a big change for the caregivers. This is the last modality I'll talk about, and it's affecting the rheological aspect of spasticity. It was done in adults, patient, adults with strokes, and it's intramuscular hyaluronidase injections. And this is a case series of 20 patients who got this injection, and it made the muscle tone come down by about 2 there was increases in pa passive and active range of movement if the muscles were in a contracture versus if they were free. We can't finish talking about tone issues without mentioning dystonia. Um, there's oral agents like trihexyphenidyl, tetrabenazine, diazepam, and baclofen. They all have side effects, and they don't really work that great in dystonia. Botox can bring it down. Sometimes it can make the dystonia manifest in a different way. Intrathecal baclofen has been shown to reduce dystonia, though. This is a summary of all the treatments that I've spoken about by age and Ashworth score. This is for GMCS 2 and 3 kids. This is how I make decisions with these patients. On the y-axis you see Ashworth score and on the x-axis you see age. So at any age you can use oral antispastics, but if they're not really working for you, 
you can get a benefit from Botox or SDR or antithical baclofen. Now the next is the next slide, JNCS 4s and 5s. It looks pretty much the same, except you can take SDR up to about the age of 13, after which you're looking at antithical baclofen. Next slide is economics. There's a lot of benefits to treating these patients properly. If you look at therapy alone, it's going to cost about a lakh per year. Oral antispasic, 11,000 rupees. Neurolysis, 2,000 to 40,000 rupees per year. Intrathecal backbone, 5 lakhs immediately and then 7,500 and refills every year. Versus an SDR, which is about 50,000 rupees for the rest of their life. But again, the value in treating tone is to get a person function. So the indirect benefits are if you really treat tone properly, a therapy becomes much more effective. You can reduce or stop oral antispastics. You may or may not need to do neurolysis. And in the nut, maybe the patient won't even need to be as dependent on their family as they are right now, which is definitely what we're aiming to do. If you have any questions, please email me. Thank you.